Hey! Today we are going to talk about compression algorithms. In particular, we are going to talk about the lempel ziv welch algorithm. I apologize for my bad accent. Okay, let's begin. First off, if you don't know what compression algorithms are for, uh, dead data, data in your computer is what makes up all of your music, all of your images, all of your video, all of your text files, all, all of your documents, everything. And typically it takes up a lot of space. We use compression algorithms often to help compress files to take up less space. Even though hardware gets better and cheaper over time, and you could get a large hard drive today for a really cheap price, if data was not compressed, you would run out of hard drive space a lot more quickly. As an example, if you were to take about one minute of uncompressed 1080p video, it would be a little bit over one gigabyte. And yet, we have Blu-ray discs that are 25 gigabytes to 50 gigabytes, and we could fit films that are full length or over two hours on those. How can we do that? We use compression. And that's why it's so important today. Okay, in this video we are going to talk about the lempel ziv welch algorithm. And it's just one of many different algorithms you could use to compress data. It is typically used in uh, different applications. Uh, to compress certain image files. It's also used in Unix's default compress command and a few other areas. It is a lossless algorithm, meaning that when you compress the data, no data is lost. So you can recover all of the data back without losing anything. Some algorithms do lose uh, information when you compress it uh, in favor of compressing, compressing it even more. So you have to decide for yourself uh, which is more important. The idea of this algorithm is that you want to use reoccurring patterns to save data space. As an example, we are going to, going to encode something that's written in ASCII code. Typically, ASCII code has every character use 8 bits, bits being 1s and zeros. This allows up to 256 unique symbols for the data. This algorithm tries to extend that library of 256 symbols to use somewhere between 9 to 12 bits per character. Now, that means we could have a lot more characters, but that would just mean that we're going to have char characters that take up even more space. Instead, we are going to have some of those extra spaces represent even more than one character. This doesn't always compress well, it depends on what you are compressing especially for short diverse strains with, with not many patterns, this won't work very well. But it is very good for compressing redundant data. And it doesn't have to save the dictionary with the data either. Even though it's making up this brand new dictionary on the fly with the data, it, when you compress it or decompress it, you, you could use the algorithm to make the library on the fly, which is really cool. As an example, I have a simple string here. I want to compress this is the. It's not a very good example, but uh, it seems to work for what I want to do. By default, if you un if this was uncompressed ASCII code, it would look like this, this long string of bits. That's hard to read, so I also converted it to the num numeric sign that it would be in ASCII. Uh, and that's about 72 bits in total. That's a lot for such a small word. We can do better. Let's see if we can compress it using our new algorithm. We start by adding pairs of symbols to the dictionary of words. That means two at a time. When, if we ever find a pair that we've already placed in the dictionary, then we use that and, and replace our, what's actually in the word with that new value from the dictionary. And then we continue. For this tiny string, we're only going to use 9 bits, even though uh, typically this would use around 12 uh, bits to make up the dictionary. So, But in this case, we have such a small string. So by using 9 bits, we are going to, going to have a dictionary in the end that could t contain up to 512 unique symbols. 
Okay, let's begin. It's It takes uh, some thinking to trace it. And uh, that's part of the reason why I'm using such a small example, because it, it does take a while to tr trace it by hand. We have four different columns here. We are going to look at the current symbol that we're looking at, the next symbol that would come after it, the output. Now that, that we know what the current one is and the next one is, do we output the current one again or do we output something else? And then we also say here if we add anything to the dictionary, both the value and what the symbol would be that it represents. Let's begin. So we start with, with T, and you can see here I have the numeric symbols next to each character uh, to make it easy for you. We start with T, the next one would be H. Is TH in the dictionary? No, so we're going to output T again, and we're going to add TH into the dictionary. And you can see here I give it a new value. Uh, 256 does not exist yet in the dictionary. We have 0 to 255, that's what ASCII code typically represents. So we are going to add this new value at 256. Next. So the next value is H. And after that would be I. Is HI in the dictionary? No. So I'm going to output H and I'm going to add HI into the dictionary. So now we have I. The next one would be H. Uh, sorry, S. S. Is IS in the dictionary? No. So I will output I and add to the dictionary IS. And the same thing with S. SI is not in the dictionary, so I output S again and add SI to the dictionary. Now here's where it gets interesting. We have I and then we have S as the next one. IS is in the dictionary, so now we have to do something. Well, we continue to see if the next character could make up a strain that's also in the dictionary. So we check if I, S, and T all combined are in the dictionary. No, it's not. So is I, S, and the dic... dic uh, I, S is the current value we have. T is the next one. Is I, S, T in the dictionary? No. So we output I, S. And we add I, S, T into the dictionary. And if you continue with the rest of the following that pattern, you, you should trace it like this, and this is roughly what you should get. And so the idea is, if you look at the output, this is what we're really outputting now. So we have these, we have seven bytes, essentially, well, not really bytes, but seven groups that would make up seven characters from the dictionary. Instead of the original, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So we're using 7 instead of 9. However, each uh, group or character does have 9 bits instead of 8. But even still, this does compress to be less than what we had before. As you can see, we now have a 63-bit strain of bytes, uh, of bits instead of the original 72 bits. So it did compress. We are now only using about 87.5% of what we were before. Now, when we compress this, notice that we had this, uh, sorry, we had TH and we had IS in the dictionary when we were, were done. If we go back here, TH was here, IS is here, so that's in the dictionary now. Now, it, But at the beginning, we did not compress the first instances of that, TH here and IS here. Those are the original representations of that here. So we did not compress everything as much as we could have. So does it make sense to go back and uh, use what you have in the your uh, new dictionary to compress those? Well, no, it does not. If you were to do that, then you would lose what T, H, H, and I, S represent, or what T, N, H, and I, and S represent. The idea is, is that you do not want to store the dictionary with the data. Because you can tell we just add stuff to, to the dictionary all the time, so it gets very large. If you were to replace this T, H, I, and S, 
with th and is, then you would uh, you wouldn't be able to make the dictionary again. You would not be able to uncompress it, and that would be a problem. Every compression algorithm needs to be able to uncompress. So you could see that the compression did work, but if we had each symbol use nine bits, uh, which we, we, were, we were using 9 bits, so we could hold up to 512 unique characters in our new dictionary. We only got up to about 261. That's almost half. Imagine how much larger the file could be before we needed to use 11 bits, 12 bits, or 13 bits. If you're using that many bits, you could compress a really large file, a, a, a typical like Word document or something like that, and you, you should have enough room in your dictionary to, to do that. Now, the compression algorithm does not work with all strains very well. If you tried this again with this strain, this is a strain, would it work? Well, not as well, because there aren't as many patterns here. You can see IS appears twice, but other than that, there aren't really any patterns to use, so it, it couldn't really take advantage of the algorithm. Okay, we'll quickly go over uncompressing. To uncompress, we need to know how many bits we're using the compression. So that's the only thing you really need to know when you save the data. It would You need some way to know uh, how many bits you're using in your dictionary. You could either keep that in the file, or you would keep that in your algorithm that is also used to, to uncompress as well as compress. We can read the characters and build a new dictionary the same way we did when we were compressing the, the file. When we reach a symbol outside the typical ASCII range, then we should have that value ready to be seen in the dictionary, and we would be able to use that. For example, I want to compress the following string. This is exactly what we had before. This is the compressed version of the string that we had before. So we start with the first one. Oh, well, well, I'll go over everything a little bit quickly here. First off, 116, this is a typical ASCII value that's between 0 and 255 and we add to the dictionary, and so on. Uh, 104, uh, that's an ASCII code, 105, one, 115. 258 is a little bit different, that's outside the ASCII range. So that must be somewhere in our code. So instead I'm going to output 105 and 115. Where did I get 105 and 115? Well, you can see over here, I add into the dictionary as I look at the values one by one. So 258 already exists in the dictionary. Great, so I can just look up the values of 258 and it's 105, 115. So that's what I would output in my uncompressed string. And when I add to the dictionary, I would add this, 105, 115, and the first value of this, which would be 116. And I continue, and we're done, and, and that, that's pretty simple. And if you did look at what your output is, compare it, uh, convert it to strain with characters, and you get exactly what we started with, so it worked fine. Now you might be a little bit confused here with what happened here. We had 258, we had 256, so we output this, and we add to the dictionary the first two values that 256 is, and the first value of this, even though this represents two values. So why are we only using the first value of this? Well, it's one of those weird cases, so if you trace this on your own, you have to be careful. Remember, the dictionary is made up with combinations of uh, characters. So you would only add the first symbol of the combination to the current combination when rebuilding the dictionary. This is what you do when you make the dictionary, when you compress the strain, and you would do the same when you uncompress it. And when, if you were uh, tracing a very small example, you, you wouldn't see this very often, but it is a serious problem if you're tr trying to code this algorithm, and we're using a really large file. Now suppose you were to include the dictionary file when you were compressing, in, with the data. This would probably make the data actually larger instead of smaller, so that's why we don't include it, and that's why we don't compress it further. And that's one of the really nice things about this algorithm, which I think is really cool. Thank you for watching.